And we are back for another edition of Tune In. I am your host and your representative, Rick Crawford. Glad you could join us. We're taking a different turn. You may have noticed that when we come in on the beginning of the week, we'll do the On the Radar segment, which basically tees up what's taking place in the course of the week. Just a little quick hit to let you know what's going on. What we wanted to do with Tune In is sort of take a little deeper dive into what goes on up here in Washington and get you a little more informed about the process that we we deal with on a routine basis up here and i think a good place to start is committees um people kind of want to know how how do we get things done or not get things done and a good place to sort of get uh, acquainted with the mechanism of congress is to start off with looking at the committees and we'll do that today you know there are 435 members in the house 100 members in the senate so 535 members of congress and we got to get together somehow to get things done and we do that by forming committees. And so there are a number of standing committees. There are select committees. We're going to get into that here in just a minute. But the main reason we do that is because an individual congressman or senator certainly can't be an expert on every subject. And so we rely heavily on these committees of jurisdiction because we're going to consider literally thousands of bills or there'll be thousands of bills introduced in the course of a year or two year period of a Congress. So Let's talk about that. What exactly are committees? Well, to make lawmaking efficient or to attempt to make lawmaking more efficient, uh, we use different committees of jurisdiction, and they were formed to handle specific issues. I serve on the Ag Committee, and I serve on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And so obviously, you know, that those uh, committees are deal with those specific issues related to that topic. Um, they're obviously comprised of both Republicans and Democrats. The majority party will determine who the, the chairman of each committee is. Um, when you first arrive in Congress and you're sworn in, there is an organizing conference, and ultimately the speaker determines who sits on what committee. But uh, a little deeper there, he does that with the advice of a steering committee. So there's even a committee on committees, for lack of a better term. We call it a steering committee that sort of uh, helps make the determination on who gets what committee assignment, and then finally the speaker will sign off on that. So that's how the determination is made. Um, four types of committees, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are joint committees, uh, conference committees, select committees, and standing committees. Now, two committees I mentioned before, agriculture, transportation, and infrastructure, that's an example of standing committee. Standing committees are the permanent committees that do most of uh, the debating, where you see on C-SPAN, you see committees, uh, hearings, and so on legislative action taking work. That's where most are uh, taking place, rather. That's where most of the work is done in Congress. There are 16 standing committees in the Senate and 20 in the House. Those committees are the ones we're going to talk about today. Each committee has a chairperson, a uh, chair as we refer to them. It usually is the face of the committee. You might see them most often on TV. Um, they are a member of the majority party, and they serve together with the most senior member of the minority party, and that is he or she is called the ranking member. So a lot of times when you see the news and you're getting a, a committee-specific information or members of Congress that are talking about something that's specific to their committee, many times you'll see the chairman of that committee or the ranking member of that committee that weighs in on a given topic. Under a committee itself, there are several subcommittees. So the committee has broad uh, jurisdiction, some broader than others, uh, but underneath that committee are several subcommittees that get a little bit deeper into the weeds um, on uh, various subjects, and we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Here's an example of a committee, uh, the House Armed Services Committee, or HASC, as we call it uh, up here. Uh, the chairman is Mac Thornberry. He's from Texas. He's the head of the House Armed Services Committee, but there are seven subcommittees under, that, uh, under his leadership, and they delve deeper into specific issues that are related to national defense and our, specifically our armed services. Um, so how do the committees work? Well, there are four primary functions for a committee. We'll talk about those. Number one, obviously, we conduct hearings. Two, we consider legislation or amendments to bills and so on. Three, to report legislation from the House uh, to the floor, to the, you know, the whole committee, the whole House. Uh, for possible consideration. And fourth is to monitor uh, the executive branch, and that is to conduct oversight and investigations. And we talk about the executive branch. Certainly, yes, we're talking about the White House, the administration, but the executive branch is all encompassing with, the gov with respect to the government because um, these various agencies that you deal with, for example, the EPA or, or uh, even the Ag Department or the Transportation Department, those are all part of um, the executive branch. And so 
our responsibility as a co-equal branch, checks and balances, is to conduct oversight into that branch of government. So that's one of the things that we do. Let's talk about hearings. All hearings, whether they're legislative in nature or oversight, have a similar formal purpose, and that's to gather information for the committee to use uh, for, for whatever the activities are that we're conducting. So, for example, on the House Ag, in the House Ag Committee, the activity primarily has been, of late, collecting information um, to craft the next Farm Bill, which is a pretty big deal for us in Arkansas. Early in this Congress, the House Ag Committee, we had our first hearing concerning uh, the economic outlook of rural America, and here's how uh, House Ag Committee uh, Chairman Mike Conaway addressed the committee. This is our first full committee hearing of the 115th Congress, and Chairman Emeritus Frank Lucas will kick off a series of subcommittee hearings on February the 28th. This is also the far first Farm Bill hearing. Uh, we will uh, also, this is also the first Farm Bill hearing as we begin to develop the next Farm Bill. So as you might expect, in hearings, members of Congress ask questions and hear the testimony of, of witnesses. Could be one witness, could be five or six. We had in the most recent committee hearing, we had five witnesses at the table. Um, and here's some testimony from that same hearing on the outlook of the rural uh, economy in, in America. I will direct my comments towards the broader picture of the U.S. ag economy, focusing on two main themes. But first, I want to talk, uh, what, what does the current farm income situation look like right now, um, based on the data that we've been collecting at USDA? Second, what is USDA's outlook for prices and production in 2017 and prospects for growth in the future? The second main function of a committee is to consider bills, legislation that's brought before the committee. Uh, it's introduced in the House or the Senate. Any member of the House can introduce a bill, um, but that legislation then has to be referred to the appropriate committee of jurisdiction. So I don't necessarily have to be on the Ag Committee to introduce a bill that's related to agriculture. Uh, I'll give you an example of that was the GMO labeling bill that was uh, introduced by somebody that wasn't on the Ag Committee, but you know we had jurisdiction on that. Um, you know, it, it kind of got a little uh, confusing on actually who had the jurisdiction on that particular bill, but it wasn't a member of the Ag Committee that introduced the legislation. Uh, legislation that the committee chair deems appropriate can be considered for markup. Now, you might hear that term a lot, markup. What does that mean? Well, basically, it's based calling up a piece of legislation to be considered within the committee. And I guess they use the term markup because they're going to mark it up and change it, alter it. Um, very seldom does a piece of legislation come into committee without being altered in some form or fashion. Even the committee chairman who offers a bill may put a, a manager's amendment on it that wrote the bill and then says, well, but there's one thing I wanted to add to it for the sake of the uh, whole committee being aware of it. We'll add this manager's amendment. You know, you hear things like that. But anybody can introduce an amendment to a piece of legislation in committee during that markup period. Uh, so we'll, we'll debate that piece of legislation. We'll make amendments, as I said, and essentially we're rewriting that considered le legislation around the framework of the original draft of that legislation. So it can look a lot different uh, than what it was first introduced. There's a, a farm bill is an example. We start with a framework or uh, the what they call the members or the chairman's mark, and then we build on that. So it's essentially the framework for the legislation and what we do to it in the course of that markup. It could change it considerably. Um, and then finally, our, our number three, rather, we report the legislation. That's basically when we've marked up a bill and it's gone through the amendment process. We've debated it. We've we've altered it, changed it. We've agreed on it. At the end of the markup, a chair would normally entertain a motion to report that legislation favorably to the House. And by House rule, a majority of the committee has to be present. It's, it's just a quorum that's required in order for us to um, uh, report that to the House. And then the committee can report the measure as introduced uh, with this, even with a series of amendments. Um, once we agree to that, the measure is ordered reported, and then most reports explain a measure's purpose and the need for the legislation, the cost associated with it, the committee votes on the amendments and the measure itself, and the position of the executive branch is something that we consider too because ultimately, you know, the president is a factor in legislation. As you know, the bills are considered in each chamber, agreed upon, sent to the to the White House for a signature, and so uh, the president is a part of, of the legislative process. So um, that brings us to the fourth purpose of a committee, and that's to conduct oversight or investigations. Um, very common, we see this, in fact, there's a standing committee on oversight and government reform. And 
they do an awful lot to make sure that certain agencies are performing the way they should, or if they're not, or if something brought to their attention, they'll conduct investigations to see what went wrong. Uh, so you can do an oversight, which is just kind of a general review of what's taking place in a given agency, or you can do an investigation when there is perceived wrongdoing in a given case. And there's been an awful lot of that type of action in the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. So conducting oversight or an investigation is traditionally done initially by staff. They do most of the work at, at, at that level. And then as they prepare, uh, then probably the committee at that point will follow up and they'll conduct some hearings based on the investigation of the staff. And so legislation may actually result from uh, the committee work on a given oversight or investigation that takes place. Here's an example. A few years back, I, I say a few years, probably two or three years back, the EPA was engaging in grassroots lobbying uh, to support a water rule. Well, you can't do that. That's They overstepped their authority in, in essentially campaigning for a rule that they were trying to promulgate. Soon after that, the House Ag Committee conducted an investigation of the EPA, and I questioned the, uh, then EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy. Take a listen. You or your legal department made efforts before this grass before the grassroots campaign was uh, undertaken to ensure the EPA staff is familiar with the kind of activity that's prohibited under the Anti Lobbying Act. Uh, we actually were following OMB guidelines prior to, to the use of Thunder. Yes. Okay. So uh, that's even worse. If, if they've received training in the Anti Lobbying Act and then engaged in lobbying, we believe we actually followed those guidelines. Yes. Well, I think the GAO uh, disagrees with that, and whether or not there's a, a there, there can be a t in, intent proven. The subterfuge and the optics of what took place there are certainly worth uh, considering. I think that, that there's some valuable lessons here in the GAO's findings, um, not the least of which is that your administ the administration and your agency is willing to go so far as breaking U.S. criminal code to push an agenda. So that's just a real brief introduction on how committees work. We're going to get into some more specifics about that, but I want to start off with that kind of a, a primer for exactly what committees do and how they're how they're put together, and we can get into a little bit uh, more specific information for you as time goes on. We appreciate you joining us for TuneIn. If you have some questions or comments, tweet us at TuneInAR1, at TuneInAR1. Make sure to include your name and your hometown so we can properly attribute your comments. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.